All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Studio Bridge Artist Spotlight. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Ray Bonilla, and uh, I am extremely honored uh, to have uh, Eric Bowman uh, here as my guest today. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I'll skip kind of the bio and everything like that, because we'll talk about Eric's uh, stuff. But uh, it's uh, it's this has been a long time coming in terms of uh, uh, us chatting. So uh, anyway, uh, Eric, thanks so much for, for coming on, man. It's Hey, it's I'm, so I'm extremely, I'm extremely honored to be here. So thank you, Ray. I appreciate yeah, it. So, uh, I, uh, you know, we, we first kind of corresponded, uh, I think like probably like 10 years ago, maybe I think, um, like I, more more or less i mean i so the story goes uh for uh for those wondering what the heck i'm talking about i remember i was in my sister-in-law's house and i saw this amazing poster um of it was like wyoming but it was like a a, a bucking bronco uh and uh, it was a cowboy on it and it was like incredible and uh, I, I said, who did this, this paint? Where'd you get this? You know, because my sister's not a collector. Of, my sister-in-law is not a collector of art at all. You know, I mean, she likes things, but she's very like, likes horses because um, she has a bunch of horses and stuff like that. So um, she said, well, you know, it was a nice uh, poster I got. And I thought, you know, it was like a a poster from, you know, just some like an old school sort of illustrator from turn of the century, maybe Philip R. Goodwin or something, something of the Brandywine lineage. And so I saw this uh, sig signature that said Bowman on it. And and uh, I looked it up and I, that's how I found, uh, you know, your work, Eric. And then I emailed you and then like not thinking anything, you know, uh, and you like emailed me this like three page response. It was like amazing. It was absolutely amazing, you know. You know, that's uh, that's how I met so many artists over the years. Uh, is just cold calling them. If I went to a town where uh, you know I hadn't been before, I would look up ahead of time to see uh, what illustrators uh, lived there, and I would just call them up and ask, you know, hey, I like your stuff. Can I come by and visit you at your studio? And ninety nine point nine percent of the time, they'd say, sure, come on over. And that's how I got to meet a lot of artists over the years. Oh, that's awesome. That, you know, that's so funny you say that because like, that's literally how I've, I, I've done it. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> that's how I like yeah. met people like, like David Grove and like, just like random, random encounters, you know, or, uh, so that, that's funny. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you give me so much great advice over the years and, um, uh, but you know, we, when we had talked, you were predominantly like an illustrator, right? And, and doing, um, landscapes mostly. Um, yeah, well, in your I, I started, I started doing fine art, you know, going out and playing air painting, doing landscapes and around, I don't know, 2000 or probably around 1999, 2000 around there. But I kept working in illustration because I had a you know family to pay for, and um, I didn't quit illustration until about 2014. And so yeah, I was overlapping fine art with illustration for about 12 years or so. Wow, wow! I mean, like I have some of this stuff uh, right here. Um, I mean, you'll see this if, if you're seeing it on the video podcast, you'll see this, but on the audio or not. But I have a bunch of like, this is what I saw, you know, what I knew you for was this type of like yeah. stuff like, wow, this is somebody, you know, because when I was coming up as an illustrator, the people that I loved were like Brandywine illustrators or um, California Impressionist, the Southwestern artists like, um, I mean, just Maynard Dixon, Bloomshine, that, that type of stuff. Um, right. fetching, of course, but like really design, yeah, really design oriented, um, stuff. And I was always gravitated towards illustrators that had, uh, done this. Um, but in, uh, uh, so, you know, talking about actually illustration really quickly, uh, you, 
So I, I looked up on your website um, and it said that you were self-taught. Uh, so you didn't go to school for art or anything like that? or No, I didn't get a chance to. I wanted to. I Out of high school, I went to, uh, I approached Art Center in Pasadena. And at that time, they wanted a two-year, uh, you know, junior college degree. And I wasn't about to go back to school and do academics again. I needed to work anyway. So even if I was able to get into that program there, I don't know if I would have stuck with it because I had moved out on my own and I need to, you know, make an income. And that's hard to do full time when you're uh, going to school full time. So, um, yeah, I just I didn't get to go to art school. I wish I had. I I strongly suggest it to any young artists that are considering it because um, I would have learned some things. That, first of all, I would have been in a community of other artists and illustrators and I would have learned a ton just being around like minded people. Um, and then, of course, all of the instruction from from the great instructors there. And so I ended up learning a lot of things that they learned early on. I learned, you know, down the road just through trial and error and, you know, different ways. But um, if I could, if I had to do it all over again, yeah, I would have sacrificed and somehow figured out a way to go to a good art school. Well, I mean, it's, it, this is something like I chatted about with um, uh, Renato Muccio. Uh, do you familiar with his work? Yeah. Um, yeah. So he, um, when he was on, bef- uh, we, we had him on and, He's he's self-taught as well. Um, and my question to you is the same that I asked him, which was like, how did you come across all of these artists then? Because uh, I'm always fascinated by that. Because I, I personally didn't get, like, I grew up with, around comic books and that was the only real art that I had, that I've been exposed to. But like anything like beyond the realm of like N.C. Wyeth or any yeah, of these I sort of illustrators. I was into comic books too. Um and that's what I thought I was going to do. When I was a kid, I thought I was going to be an animator. And then that was too repetitious when I tried doing it on my own with a friend who had a camera and we we did a little film. And and then I thought I wanted to get into comic books. And I did some, I did a couple of comic books, uh, two self-published ones, and then a published one through a small publisher in San Francisco. And I did a strip for a while for a motorcycle magazine. And, and I... I thought I would keep pursuing that. And I moved to Portland, Oregon when I was about 26 years old. And I started showing my portfolio around, hoping to get just some, you know, advertise. I was going to advertising agencies, showing art directors my portfolio to see if I could get any kind of work. And my portfolio consisted of, um, you know, some airbrush art, some T-shirt designs, logo designs, comic book work. I was all over the map. And they kept telling me I should go talk to a guy named Jim Smith who owned uh, a studio called Art Farm. And that was a a centralized studio in a big old Victorian house in Southwest Portland. And they had like a dozen illustrators there. Each illustrator had his own room. And um, the uh, Jim was the uh, uh, operated as the rep. He'd go into town and get all the jobs, bring them back and dole them out to whichever artist was you know right for the job and when i showed him my portfolio he could see some raw skills and he and he invited me to move in there and that's really when my education you know non-education slash on the job education started by just talking to and looking over the shoulders of established illustrators and watching wow. you know work their craft and i was introduced to all kinds of different mediums and textures you know surfaces and and then that's when I threw away the whole idea of, of comics. I I realized illustration was way more fun and way more um, exciting because, you know, you'd work on a job for a week or two, and then you didn't know what the next job was going to be that you would get. You know, it might be an illustration for Nike, might be a technical pen and ink drawing. It might be a, a full color uh, acrylic painting, or it might be storyboards for commercials. So I was learning to do all these different things on the job. And I was there for about uh, a little less than three years. And I moved to another studio across town with another, a couple of other guys. So it, wow. my education was really on the job being around other professionals. So, you know, I didn't just figure it all out on my own, but I don't have a formal education either. So somewhere in between. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that. I mean, for those that aren't, aren't don't um, 
don't know what illustration studios are is that back in the day they um just like animation studios just like video game studios they were illustration studios that um that were around the country that serviced you know all the cities each city's needs or town's needs for for illustration yeah, this, this so studio was very much uh, um local and regional in the portland market and it's 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 been gone for a long time and in fact there was another studio called east side illustration in portland that was another group of guys and they've all you know moved on uh, some of them passed away or retired and i don't really know of any that have taken their place i think once the once the internet came along and there was more you know communication going on i think a lot of people just began working out of their own singular studios and not in groups so much. But yeah, I was very fortunate to be, you know, in there in the, in the late eighties um, to be a part of that group studio session, because it was a lot of fun and it was a good education. Yeah. I, I, um, I know like Greg Manchus uh, credited Hellman design and associates right. for, for a lot of his education. Um, and I mean, that's the stuff like me personally, just as a, when I was learning this stuff, that's like the best type of uh, education is just learning from other professionals too. Like yeah, and you were you learning have, on the job too, which is. Right. But if you could have the, the foundation of going to school first, it would have been all that much better, mm -hmm. you know, but I, you know, I, I thank God for it. I wouldn't go back and change it. It's I'm where I'm at now because of the, the route I took and believe me, a lot of very serendipitous, bizarre, you know, coincidences, if you want to call them that happened. Um, you know, during my, my career, illustration career, um, you know, just meeting certain people and, uh, and, and learning things along the way, just happenstance, you know, I'm a firm believer that if you really have a lot of passion, uh, you know, you've got drive, your goal is to be a professional artist, um, and you work hard at it, doors will open and, you know, you'll meet the right people and things will happen. I mean, that's, that's my experience anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, for, you know, I mean, I'm not, I, I've, I still, I'm, I'm almost 40, but I, I think I'm still like young in my head, you know? Uh, yeah. You're young. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all, all of the, uh, all, you know, all of my opportunities have, have literally come from just that. So, uh, that's awesome. I mean, so did you, so the cool thing about the studios is that you learned, you tend to learn like a little bit of everything in terms of like different right. types of techniques. You have different types of artists, different types of needs for jobs. Um, so how did you come across uh, painting? Because oil painting, of course, wasn't like really known for it being at the, at that time, especially like a illustration medium, just because of the, the speed yeah. factor. Um, so, you know, there were some guys that were, were working in oil like Thomas Blackshear, mm -hmm. um, who coincidentally, he's the only guy I ever wrote a letter to that didn't respond. Um, <laughs> but if you're seeing this, Thomas, I'm nailing you again on that. We're friends now. So I, I always I always stick him with that, remind him of that fact. Um, <laughs> but he was such a busy guy at the time. Everybody, everybody wanted a piece of him back then. Yeah, He was one of my early heroes. And uh, and now we're, we're buddies, so it's kind of fun. But um yeah, so you have to be a jack of all trades, basically, um, to work at a regional market or a local market, because, like I said, you don't know what the job's going to call for. And it's, you know, if you're uh, versatile in your skills and, and uh, mediums, then it's, it's very helpful. Um, what happened was when I got married in 92, um, we bought our first house, like within six months, we, we'd both been saving money and... Um, we bought our house, and so my wife moves in with all of her stuff, and she had a, a, a poster print of a Croyer painting. I don't know if you know who Croyer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Is that uh, so, uh, uh, Swedish or Finnish? Yeah, yeah, right, right. right so yeah. she wanted to hang this up um, uh, above the mantle over the fireplace, and, I'm, and I said, no, we're not going to hang a print, a poster. You know, was this a cheap poster? And she said, okay, fine, then paint it for me. Copy it. So I'm like, oh, gee, okay. So I did have some oil paints um, I hadn't been using for years. I dug those out 
and set up an easel. And I started painting a copy of this Croyer painting. And it was a very impressionistic painting. And so I was painting it very loosely, which I never really attempted before. And I realized I was having a lot of fun with this. And it seemed to be, you know, the, the copy I was doing wasn't very good, but it was, um, it was fun because it was loose and quick. And I was just making big marks with the paint, having fun with it, which I'd never done before. I'd, I'd been up to that point, I'd been um, an, an airbrush illustrator where everything is just completely detailed. And I'm using triple yeah. lock brushes for outlines and, you know, everything's blended perfect. And so this was a departure. And by the time I got done with it, I had so much fun that, you know, I was telling my wife that this is really cool. And I want to know more about this artist. Well, that Christmas, um, I got a calendar. I think she bought me the calendar of American Impressionists. And I zeroed in on a couple paintings in this calendar by Frank Benson. And oh, I copied man. both of those. Yeah. And, so, you know, and then I started, I started getting a more comfortable feel with, with oil paint because before that it was kind of mystical to me and I was always afraid of the drying time. That's why I never wanted to attempt it with a job because illustration jobs, you know, you got to turn these things around and, and back then you didn't, uh, uh, you know, send anything digitally. I had to pack up the art and ship it to the, to the art director or the designer, whoever was buying the art to have them scan it and print it. So it had to be bone dry before I let it out of my studio and oils just took longer to dry, at least I thought. You know, I've kind of figured out a way to get them to dry quicker. But uh, that was my introduction to oil painting. And I gradually, slowly started introducing it into illustration jobs because it was just a better medium. It's it's so much more, um, you know, painter friendly than acrylics are. Acrylics just dry too fast. You, you don't have the time to blend them and grade eight and vignette them like you can with oil paint. And at the same time, I was discovering all of the old uh, golden age guys. And most of them were painting in oil. Like you said, like Wyeth and Cornwell and Harvey Dunn and all those guys. So I was trying to emulate some of their style into what I was doing. And, and oil was the vehicle for that. That's awesome. Wow. Wow. To run, run across people like Frank Benson. I love that whole uh, Boston school uh, of art. But man, Benson's, it's like the thick juicy like pieces of light that he's just putting in his pieces like yeah oh, and man, i wouldn't have, so i wouldn't have found him except for that calendar i wow. mean I, I would have figured him out you know found him out later at some point but um it was still a while after i found about out about him before i discovered you know the california impressionists and you know the, the taos painters and all these other guys that came a few years later but wow. benson was the first um impressionist guy that i really liked it's yeah. interesting that that's so cool, especially the fact that you it's just serendipitously like just mm -hmm. got into copying them. And and that's how, I mean, that is like the I amount guess of I stuff have, that you would have, have credit my wife credit yeah. her for coming up with that Croyer poster, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, it could have been, a, you know, it could have been a uh, Kincaid painting or something. Right. 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 That it was Croyer. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. So, uh, so then you would just switch to like the illustration. I mean, um, uh, oil painting just for, well, from I did, there I on did for it, the most part. I actually did it in the middle of a job. I got a, I got a job with time life music doing, um, uh, what was the series? The, um, the glory days of rock and roll. So I think it was 20 album covers or, you know, wow. CD covers by that time. And I started, I started the job doing them purely in acrylic and I got halfway through and I started putting some oil over the acrylics. And by the time, because the job lasted, you know, a few months, by the time I was doing the last few, I did them in oil. And in fact, I called um, Greg Manchez at one point because he was, he lived nearby and, um, and I asked him, you know, I know that you can't paint oil over acrylic, but you, I mean, acrylic over oil but you can paint you know oil on a a water-based acrylic ground you know most most cotton canvas is acrylic or a water-based acrylic gesso right. and um i said but it, but i, I guess I, oh, what happened was some some corrections came up i needed to do last minute and i didn't want to do them in oil because i knew they wouldn't be you know dry in time to ship 
And, and he said that he, he confided in me that, yeah, he's, he's cheated a couple of times. As long as the oil surface was really dry to the touch, he, he'd gone over, you know, with some acrylic and touched up just some little small parts and paintings before. And so, you know, he said, it's okay to, to do that. Just don't go thick. And don't, you know, don't, don't do a whole big passage with that. So I think I did that on a couple of those covers and they, they turned out okay. Oh yeah. man. Uh, next time I talk to him, I got to expose him. Well, he's been exposed online now, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, Greg, well, Manches, uh, yeah, yeah. Greg, Greg Manch has painted acrylic over oils. This just in, you know, that's, that's funny. That's so illustration though. Like, um, I, got you know, I guess it, you know, yeah, but illustrators today that don't necessarily have to go through, like, they don't have to go through that, you know, cause it's like compatibility. Like you can make, you could put digitally an oil oh, painting. Can, yeah. You could do whatever you want, you know, yeah, but yeah. like to, to hear stories like that, you know, like it's like, uh, like it won't, it won't, you know, it won't fall apart. So it's still possible, you know, like, I love that. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. I was very rules oriented and I knew it was a rule. You can't do that. So I was <laughs> out until Greg said, no, it's okay. Just, just, you know, be real careful when you do it. Right. Right. Uh, that's great. Wow. So what, what, uh, what time period was that? Oh, uh, that was probably the maybe the late nineties, early maybe two thousand, right in there. Okay, okay. So yeah, because so past two thousand one, I mean, um, were you? I know, like the illustration market really switched because uh, I know digital was really starting to come into to play around that time. Um, oh, yeah. So. Uh, was that when, uh, like, were you painting at all at that time? I know you said like. Well, you know, what happened you... was I met I met a couple of fine artists, um, Tim Soliday and Steve Houston. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And spent Great fine artists, yeah. Spent one weekend with them. What happened was, a uh, an illustrator from LA moved up here just over the river in Washington State, and he was doing a lot of airbrush work for Disney, and he needed help because he was getting too much work. So he put the word out and heard about me. And so I went over and met him and and we hit it off and, and I ended up doing a bunch of side work for him, helping him out. So he goes down to uh, to his folks house in L.A. for Christmas and he took his camcorder with him and he decided to pay his old high school buddy, Tim Soliday, a visit who he hadn't seen in 20 years. And he heard Tim was now a painter. And so he went over to Tim's house and filmed the inside of Tim's studio and he brought it back home. And up to this point, you know, I was just, I was purely an illustrator. I knew nothing about fine art. I never even heard the term plain air painting. <laughs> and, uh, and my friend brings this video back and he says, Hey, look what my friend's doing. And he, I look at this video and it was the inside of Tim's studio, his garage studio in Altadena, California. And it was plastered with, um, uh, live, you know, live model sketches, paintings, drawings. The floor was stacked with plein air paintings, like eight by tens and six by eights, just little ones, but just, you know, like hundreds of them. And the color and the immediacy of it really caught my attention. And I said, man, I want to, I want to know more about this stuff. I want to meet this guy. So my wife and I were going down to Long Beach to visit my parents um, at, uh, in the spring and so I went down there and, and my friend arranged it so I can go meet Tim. So I went and spent the day with Tim Soliday and he took me around. He took me out plain air painting. All I had was a sketchbook with me. So I was basically just watching what he was doing, but I was, you know, sketching alongside of him. And then the next day he took me over to Steve Houston's studio and wow. Steve at the time was working on a, a sculpture. We walked in the studio. He had this big, bigger than my studio, this big cavernous warehouse where he had been teaching life drawing to um, animators at, I think, Disney and um, Pixar, Sony, somewhere, you know, a couple, two or three wow, different yeah. studio, animation studios would send their uh, uh, animators over there. Anyway, it was just him alone with a model, a live model. He was sculpting this boxer. You know, Steve's real famous for doing his boxing. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, for uh, sure. So I was blown away by his work and and I asked him if I could, you know, videotape what he was doing. And then I walked around his studio and just looked at all the stuff that was tacked up on his walls. And there were, you know, hundreds of 
uh, and I'm not exaggerating, there's hundreds of sheets of paper and artwork throughout this studio. And I filmed a bunch of it. And I talked to him for a while and he gave me some tips. And and by the time I got home, over, you know, just one weekend, I got home and my whole world was turned upside down. And I realized this is what I want to do. I want to be, I want to get into fine art. I don't want to be an illustrator the rest of my life. And so that's when the change started happening. But from that point on, it took a dozen years to make that switch to where I could call up my rep in in New York and say, I'm I'm done. I'm moving on. And you know, they were really, really nice about it. They knew that was my goal. So they wished me well. And and I remember hanging up the phone thinking, ah, that's it. I'm a, I'm now a full-time fine artist. I'm done with illustration. Wow. And now I can be a painter, you know. So um I forget what your original question was there. I kind of No, yeah, no. I mean, like, so that you would uh you would basically answered answered it and and then some, you know, questions that are follow-up questions that I was gonna uh, ask you about that. So I mean, like that um so that transition, um, like I know, I mean, I was fortunate enough that I had mentors like Craig Nelson and um Bill Mon over at the Academy of Art that that were were gallery painters and illustrators at the same time. And so they prepared us for like the mentality, you know, that you have to kind of have um, or the difference in mentality in, in, in terms of being a fine artist versus being an illustrator and what is demanded right. of you and, and stuff like that. So was that transition difficult uh, at all? Um, it was, it, it probably would have been if I tried to do it overnight, but since I still had to make an income for my family, because they're, you know, my wife doesn't work, um, at least for income. She's a she's a flower designer, so she works part time in a flower shop. She loves doing that. But um, you know, all the income was on me, and I was making a decent illustrate, you know, living as an illustrator. I couldn't just drop that and expect to start making gallery sales right away. Right. So, um, but yeah, by the last maybe three years of doing illustration, it was incredibly frustrating because. Um, well, after 2008, 2009, when the economy kind of crashed, you know, the recession hit real hard, um, everything, you know, I, I'd been in galleries by then for maybe three or four years, but, uh, you know, making my, the, the bulk of my income off of illustration, but it was like both worlds, almost like the faucet just turned off. The galleries started closing down. They weren't making sales. Um, illustration slowed way down. And so um, I thought, well, now's my chance to spend more time doing, you know, fine art painting. But if the phone called when I'm in the middle of a, you know, of a painting, maybe I went out and did a plein air study and came back and was working up a large uh, landscape and having fun with it um, and painting loose and, you know, a different, completely different approach than what my illustration was. Um, my rep would call and say, I've got a job for you. And well, when your rep calls, that's for sure money. You know, that's a, that's a check that's going to come. So I have to stop what I'm having fun with and take on this illustration job and go back to working really tight and doing a lot of detail and, and following the, the directive of the, the art director. And and I, it just got to be really frustrating. I just did not want to do that kind of work anymore. I was, I was you know, making strides in my oil painting explorations and that's, you know, knowing that's where I wanted to go full time anyway, at some point I needed to put more time into that, less time into this illustration. And so, um, yeah, those last few years were really difficult making that switch over. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, so you, all of these like ones that I'm showing here, so this was kind of like, uh, I mean, I, this is from my like snapshots from your blog that I used to follow all the oh, time we, we you need know. to get some new snapshots because yeah a lot of yeah them are just not very good they're old stuff <laughs> yeah yeah but so this was like the old stuff this is when you were still an illustrator right um yeah, yeah most of this i was still doing illustration jobs so so you were like i know you were like drawing from the model uh plain air painting um you know doing i, I know some of these things were like uh kind of uh, doing paintings almost like um, they reminded me of kind of like Bert Silverman, like like a uh, very like ordinary people doing. Yeah, I was basic trying to labor find, that type of stuff. I was trying to find a genre that I could get sales with. So I, um, a local uh, 
artist photographer had uh, he had the account with the Oregon um, Ballet Theater here in, wow. in in the city, and he would go down and shoot photos for them all the time. So when I started having um, life painting sessions in my studio, I would have like half a dozen artist friends come over. They'd pay for the model. I'd supply the place. And then we'd paint from the live model. And well, this guy was able to get live, you know, professional uh, ballerinas to come and pose for us. Wow. For a few sessions. So I did a bunch of that. You know, it's a typical, you know, Degas kind of traditional subject matter that just about mm-hmm. everybody does at some point. And so, um, but I, you know, before I got into the Western thing, I tried that. I tried painting uh, blues and jazz artists. Yeah, I have, I have these, uh, man, I, this is the stuff that I remember seeing like, yeah, some of these are really yeah. bad reproductions. Cause you know, uh, you probably wish the same thing, you know, you might have a good painting or, or three or five of them that are out there online, but people have pumped the color up and shared them with other people. And Oh we, my God. Yeah. Time. Now they just look yeah. so God awful. I wish I could yeah. just rid of them again. You know, I want to get rid of them. <laughs> but uh, somebody right. is suffering from that so uh, i'll i'll scroll i'll scroll really quickly from that so you know but uh yeah so these are i remember these uh for sure because you were doing a lot of like music uh yeah. and then i remember seeing this um for yeah an illustration that's, that's job. like a yeah that was an illustration job that's kind of an embarrassing painting now well um, you know I, well it's like i was like oh that's i was like you know i remember thinking like wow you know Eric could do something like he can do anything, man. He could do some nice cowboys, you know. And I just thought about that and then just like, you know, I didn't think anything of it, you know. Uh so so you did that's a lot all, of, that's lot of all searching. Old stuff. Yeah, and I was searching right, right. trying to find something. And all those sold eventually, but it wasn't until I got into the Western thing where um I really found, you know, a passion and an audience. Well, I mean, I think I think it's 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 like uh, I think it's cool to tell, like to show, like how because now, you know, everyone, anyone that knows your work, immediately connects you to Western art, right? Because that's that's what you're you're known for. But in like, and I, but I remember I was really I I find my, I consider myself really lucky to see kind of like that transition happen kind of before my eyes. I I, I remember these paintings you had done you know, uh, of your daughter. Cause it always reminded me of, of this NC Wyeth painting. Oh, was, okay. It was like dying. To sh- to, I was like, I have to yeah. show Eric this. Cause I always thought about this, this NC Wyeth painting. Oh, that's his um, wife. Yeah. And he, um, so I was like, oh, that's, that's so cool. Uh, but like this, this type of stuff just isn't kind of happen overnight, you know? And, um, no, that's all, you know, transitional kind of stuff, searching, trying to figure out what I want to do, where I want to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so what up in the corner? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So I got I got t- plenty of western stuff. Yeah, and and you know I got your the blog and everything like that. But I remember this piece specifically was like it was more for like um a Spanish woman and a guitar and I was like, "Oh, this is cool. This is like the same music thing, but kind of a right. western flair to it." And I I really like that, you know, like I've, I've always like, I love, I've always loved that. Like, like you were saying the Taos painters and like, um, you know, just all, all of, all, all of those painters, there's so many to, um, to, to count, but it was like kind of a nice, nice shift. So when it, when did this happen to you? Like what, what caused you to kind of, is it just like ex- exploring? Um, yeah. I was trying to come up or- with, like, you know, probably like every artist is doing Western work, you're trying to come up with, uh, you know, some kind of, some way to bend the genre a little bit, introduce some fresh subject or different subject matter into the Western um, genre. And Well, I, I guess my, my, uh, my question is like, how, how did you just select Western art? Like what, what caused you to, oh, so to do that? The story yeah. on that was, um, and I just told this at my, uh, my opening last weekend. Um, so, you know, I had been aware of like the cowboy artists of America and, and 
a lot of the illustrators that turned into Western artists like Tom. Totally. Lovell. Oh man, Tom yeah. Lovell's so good. It's right. Insane. And like yeah. how turpening and oh man. Right. But all those guys oh, yeah. were doing the Western subject in a very highly detailed, um, you know, very straightforward manner. Right. And I I for some reason I was under the impression that if I was gonna follow suit and do that, number one, I didn't want to do that that level of detail and number two um i didn't want to do that all that research and i thought that you had to do that if you're going to be a western artist you know you have to right. practice to become a cowboy yourself to do it right. and so i i gave i didn't i didn't go down that path for a number of years and then um logan hajaj uh he started you know who that is of course yeah yeah so logan, uh-huh. Logan, and I'm sure there was other guys too, but Logan's the one that I zeroed in on because I, I guess I got exposed to his work first. He began doing the Western subject matter in a much more stylized manner and having success with it. And then I, I realized, well, okay, I'm I'm kind of holding myself back. I'm, I'm missing the chance here of, of doing a subject I like because I think I don't qualify because I'm going to have to do it, do it, you know, highly detailed. And Right. And Logan proved that you don't have to do it that way. And in fact, there was a whole new wave of of Western guys coming up that I wasn't aware of who were doing things very stylized. And so um, just as an experiment, I did a, a little head of a cowboy, this old grizzled cowboy smoking a cigarette. Just I think it was like a 12 by 12 painting. And I I put it on my, um, on, I think I was on Facebook at the time. And I put it on social media and you know, it was getting a little bit of attention. And my aunt, who um, is a collector, an art collector, and she's she's well-to-do. She's been a collector a long time. She wanted to support me, so she offered to buy that painting. And so I sold it to her. Right after that happened, um, Bo Alexander, you know, Logan's brother of Maxwell yeah. Yeah. Gallery, he contacted me and because uh, he saw it, and he, he invited me to be in there um, small work show that was coming up at the time. This is t- like 2016. And uh, they invite other outside artists that they don't regularly represent mm-hmm. small works once a year. And so I was thrilled. I'm like, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to be in it. But I had to tell him that that painting was already sold. And he said, well, do you have another one you can put in? And I said, sure. You know, I I didn't have one. <laughs> but I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, um, and so I, you know, I had to whip something up over the weekend. And uh, right. and then um and up to that point, the the artwork I'd been the fine art I'd been putting in galleries, I'd been using really cheap frames with. And I knew for for this, this is a high-end gallery, and this is like, you know, my chance at the big time, so to speak. And right. I thought I gotta step up my framing. So I contacted um uh, Mayan Olson framers down in Southern California, one of the best framers in the country. Um, and I, I arranged for them to frame it and I sent the painting down to them and Phil Olson, the principal, you know, one of the two partners that owns it, he called me up and he said, I love this painting. I want to buy it. And so I thought, wow, here's, here's, you know, some sure money. Um, but <laughs> it's designated to go in this show. So I told them why well, I've already, committed to this show and he said I, st- I don't care i have to buy it so i said well all right as long as you'll hang it and let it hang in the show i'll sell it to you and then i and then i gave the commission to Bo at maxwell alexander which i thought was a good gesture mm-hmm. and then Bo called up and he said he was fine with that and he says you got something else since that's sold you want to put in the show and i said yeah i got sure <laughs> you know, it's like, right yeah. behind me it's right behind yeah, me. yeah it's here somewhere <laughs> yeah. so i, I, I you know, whipped out another one and sent it and it sold in the show. And then he called up, they were going to do a, uh, a regional, uh, or what do you call it? A, a, uh, uh, it was like an on the road show, um, in Santa Fe okay. uh, show. And so he asked me if I wanted to put something in there and that was a, a couple of months away still. And I said, I'd love to. And I came up with another painting and, and sent it down to him and they sold that. So after a while I thought, uh, you know, I need to call this guy up and find out what's going on. I So I called him and I said, um, so am I in the gallery now? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, you're in the gallery. We just haven't put you on the website yet. And 
so that's how I got into Maxwell Alexander Gallery. Wow. That kind of kickstarted my Western art career. Wow. Wow. That's and from there he got me. I mean, I it was the prestige of being in that gallery with that group of artists helped get me some recognition. And I got invited to the Autry Museum to be in the master's show there. Right. And right. once you get into a, a museum show, all the other museums, they're always watching each other to see who they're, you know, putting in these shows. And and then I got invited to uh, the Pre de West, which is the premier Western art show in the, mm-hmm. in the country or in the world, really. So right. I, I have wow. that Alexander Gallery to thank for, for opening those doors. Wow. I, I, I love that Masters of the American West show and the Pre de West show. I mean, like I always look at their their website i mean it's it's such a really interesting set of events because you really don't have that in any other sort of areas of like figurative art you know no, they um, don't they really i mean don't. you have the california like gold medal show like the california arts club but like it's yeah. not really like it's it's not like this where like everyone's it's like an invite and then there's like prizes it's like it really reminds you of like the 19th century in paris for like the Prix de Rome and like with a salon. Um, it's the market. It's, it's, There's, it's a, it's an extremely um, strong market. That's exclusive to America, the Western, you know, subject matter. Um, one that I don't think will ever go out of style entirely. It may wax and wane and be popular and then maybe not so much for a few years, but, but right now it's, it's a strong market and uh, you're right. So it's, that's why, galleries that handle you know really good western artists are doing well and these museum shows are popular with collectors you know there was a time when um uh like the plain air painters of america the papa group was all the rage and they were having sellout shows on catalina island and and even laguna plain air painters that i used to be a, a member of uh they would have their shows in the laguna art museum in southern california and People would fly in. I mean, you know, the rich, deep pocket wow. fly in. There'd be a line around the museum. Well, all of that peaked in the like the late '90s, really. And even though those organizations are still around, they're not as hot as they once used to be. So their markets are less. And perhaps if they were, I mean, maybe back then at their peak, they were having you know sellout shows in museums and not just galleries. But right. Uh, but right now it seems to be the the time for. For Western art, and it's anybody's guess how long it's going to last. It won't last right. forever. Yeah, I, I just think that like nowadays, it's such a like you were saying the diversity and the approach to it. I mean, like uh, is 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 really cool to see because it's like it has you know uh, your work, Logan's work, you know, like Thomas Blackshear is now doing Western art. Like um, it's adding such a variety of. Uh, of approaches because like i mean when i was coming up in school western art for me was howard turpening tom lovell frank mccarthy like we're talking like right highly detailed there were historical paintings that's what they they felt like it was like it was like historically they were were illustrators doing historical paintings telling the narrative and they you know they had to know the correct gun uh, for the time period the the correct tack on that horse for the time period all the right clothing all that stuff and it's like that's the last thing i want to do is to go into research so i'm not i'm not interested <laughs> the history is interesting but i'm not interested yeah. in searching history to make a painting i want to make if i can i want to make a beautifully composed picture that you know resonates with people you know maybe on the on the subject matter but firstly just for the the color and the design and the application of paint um, that's what I want to hit people with because that's the fun part. You mm-hmm. know, the fact that it's in, that it can be categorized as a Western painting is secondary to me really. Right. And I think it's, it's interesting because there was always like, a, at least in my head, a difference between what they were doing in something like Southwestern art, like the Taos painters, like all of, all of that stuff was like, about the culture and like really embraced design. And like, when I think about like, something like Maynard, you know, yeah, the, Maynard the, Dixon. The right. Maynard Dixon's kind of a singular guy like Frank Tenney Johnson. Right. But right. The guys, especially Blumenshine and Higgins, they were being influenced by the modernists of the time period. And so you can tell in Blumenshine's work, he's bringing in cubism 
and yeah and all that all that design stuff just, so they're just like the mountain cool. ranges and things like that right it's just yeah. like they weren't like this historic like a super accurate thing it was just like a beautiful shape that went across and like the figure right. was you know just like just there everything was like really like a the design behind it was really emphasized and the shape of what yeah, you know was just, pushed and right on the cusp of, of representationalism and but leaning more into impressionism and mm -hmm. some of the other isms you know it was it was a lot of a lot of experiment going on there but um yeah that's some of my favorite stuff and so what's happening now is a lot of of guys that are on the scene now are kind of um like myself of course i'm emulating a lot of influence from the taos guys um and still trying to make it my own which is really hard to do but um it's that it's kind of a second wave really of uh stylized western art that's happening now and mm -hmm. maybe that'll show up in the history book someday maybe not maybe it'll all be you know just a flash in the pan i don't know i'm just well I'm just glad it, to be able to it, do it. it's it's almost like the uh the the first generation of of Western artists, you know, had like, you know, McCarthy level, like those, that, that realm was almost like a neoclassical period. And then you, you had, you know, much more impressionistic um, painters come in like Bill Anton's somebody I think of, you know, where it's like level, but painterly, but not, you know, um, and then you almost like your, your, the way that you're a part of, it's almost like post-impressionistic in a sense. Like, it's like, the design is coming through like there's more influences from outside uh of of the genre you know um i mean like you know thomas blackshire's doing art nouveau stuff you know you're uh you know i see a lot of that uh being pushed and, and embracing kind of the 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 mo you know modernist sensibilities on things and um well, I, I, I think that's really really cool you know i i thank you i can't take you know a lot of credit about you know because remember i didn't go to art school so i don't know all the technical stuff yeah um, you know i just paint the way i do and i paint what excites me and i and i have a lot of influence as you can tell by other artists mostly all dead guys that that really get me excited with what they were doing and i i agree with with the statement that tim soliday made when i first met him and that's that fine art peaked a um, hundred to 150 years ago and we have not and may never again reach that same level and i'm talking across the board you know a, a continuity of high level fine art that was being done 100 years ago is not being done across the board um, consistently nowadays there are, there's a few people that are i'm not one of them but there's there might be a few people that are reaching those heights but um you know and not just painting, but sculpture, music, literature, all that stuff. There were they, that was a golden age back then. And, you know that's why the golden age illustrators are referred to as such. There was just a high degree, high level of quality. Um, and if you couldn't reach that high level, you couldn't really make a living. Not much of one as an illustrator. You you might end up doing, you know, spot illustrations in pulp magazines or something. Mm -hmm. but, but the best painters that I look to are all dead from way back then, you right. know? So it's it, interesting that that skill set um, found a, uh, a, a market in, in this type of painting um, because it's like you were saying, like in traditional illustration, uh, that type of illustration, like from your era, like Thomas Black's your era, uh, his you know both of your eras like it, it doesn't really exist anymore it's it's not it's more kind of like in, in entertainment arts um oh you're talking uh, in, illustration? In the, yeah but just like that type of training like the figurative oh. type of like a multi-figure training where a narrative based i mean well that, the jobs that type, you know yeah i don't know if the jobs are there to support that but the but people are you know going back to ateliers and and, and getting back into more traditional um, painting and training um, processes. You know, what I noticed when when digital art came along, you know, when Photoshop hit the market, um, I was, I I took a while before I got my first computer because I, was, I wasn't I was interested in doing anything digitally. 
I was all excited about learning how to paint with oils. But what I noticed was um, the illustration directories that I was advertising in at the time, like the workbook and the mm-hmm. black book, the um, showcase. So the show, American Showcase illustration originally was one volume. Yeah. But when when Photoshop came along, all of these um, wannabe designers and art directors who wanted to do illustration suddenly could collage some photos and tweak them and throw some type on top and cut, you know, cut out the illustrator and do the illustration themselves. And those, I watched those, those directories swell up and get really fat with all these people that were doing, you know, really kind of crappy digital illustration. And then a, a few, it only took maybe, I don't know, five years and they all shrunk back down again because I think the the public could realize that this really wasn't quality artwork that these guys were right. doing. And so, um, and I think there was a backlash too, especially with younger illustrators like yourself. I mean, you look at you, you're a painter with traditional media. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of guys who were probably being trained to, to do illust- uh, digital illustration and were brought up with, with Photoshop were confronted at some point with, um, you know, and I, I mean, you're really confronted now with AI coming on the scene, but confronted with the fact that you're get, we're getting further and further away from things that are being handmade. And all of their heroes um, were, were the same heroes that I looked to back in the day that, you know, obviously did nothing digital. They were all working with traditional media. And so there was this backlash. And I think a yearning also from, from the general audience, the public, wanted to see things whether they knew it or not, I think maybe even on a subconscious level, people were getting to realize that everything they saw was, com- you know, made by a computer, it wasn't yeah. handmade. And people really, you want that, there's got to be a human connection somewhere. And I know you have to draw these ideas out as those come from human beings and the initial sketches and so forth. But something that's completely done digitally, um, a lot of people find that to be kind of cold and, you know, I think there's there's an audience that really wants to see handmade art. So. Yeah, and and I think the train that I mean for my generation it was like like this embrace on both ends in terms of like we we knew that um, at least when I was in school it was really clear we we quickly learned that like the software literally was just a tool and the 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 training you know, gave you the sensibility and the eye and de- and had you develop your taste and all of that stuff came from you interacting with right. physical media, you know, and that that's how, at least how, how we were trained and um, give it, you know, cause I mean, my, all my illustration work looks like oil painting, but it's, it's all digital. Yeah. And, and I don't want to, I, 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 no, no, I know what you mean, but like, I think like a painter and like the thinking behind right. it, you can't, you have to learn that stuff. You know, I learned from uh, drawing from the model, uh, painting from the model, plain air painting, and studying people like um, like we were talking about before, you know, painters from the past. And um, so I think like that, yeah, you're right. Because that's the, that, like, I think the, I think people misconstrue, at least as a, uh, students coming in, don't realize like learning how to draw and learning how to paint does it mean it has nothing to do with like copying something? Like if you're like really good at copying, doesn't mean you've learned how to draw or paint. It's, yeah. it's so much more than that. There's there's design sense. There's especially well, when you're think, dealing thing. with narrative and design and composition are the number one thing in making a picture. I mean, if you don't right. have that right, if the drawing is bad, then forget doing anything else. You're not going to save it with with value and temperature and so forth. So you're right. You can learn those things digitally as well. But um, I think as far as the final product that hangs in a gallery, you, you know, you can't hang a, you can hang a monitor on the wall and show somebody <laughs> digital or a print, right. you know, right. but, um, but yeah, there's still a very, very strong market, I think, for traditional media works of art, whether they be paintings or sculptures or. Totally. I, I think also it's just the, the physicality of a painting, right? I mean, it's so. Um, we, we were talking, I was talking about this with, um, John English and a bunch of our students, uh, uh, the other day where it was like the difference between like in, in digital painting or something, like if I wanted to do, uh, 
six foot by six foot painting, no problem. I would just dial up the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the size and it would just be a really large file size and I'd be on my way. But like when you're actually painting something that large, uh, and it's taking up that amount of air in, you know, and you're oh, confronted yeah. with that as a human being, you know, that's, that's such a different experience. Um, well, that's, that's a, yeah. And that's a really important point for painters too. It's, there's a, um, there's a, a gap that happens between your comfort zone. You know, when I first started painting outdoors, I was, I was following the uh, Kevin McPherson model. Oh yeah. And he yeah, did. Me too. I own it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he was showing you to know, start with little six by eight canvases and just do, you know, do a thousand of those things. And I was intimidated by like a nine by 12 or 12 right. by 16. That was like too big to it's do. It's like outdoors. huge, right? Yeah. In an hour and a half, you know, cause the sun's moving, the shadows are changing. You got to paint quickly, but I worked my way up to it. And, um, but what I found even in the studio is when you're going from your comfort zone, which may be, um, you know, a, a 34 by 40 or, or, a you know, maybe smaller, maybe a, a 24, 36, something like that. Um, you know, we don't grow with, obviously with the ratio of the canvas or the size of the canvas, our eyes are only so far apart and our arm is only so long holding a brush to the canvas. And we're only, you know, we're between five and six feet uh, tall on average. So um, there's some things you can do within your comfort zone, loading up a brush and making a, a mark that will not translate to a mural sized painting. You know, you can't, you can't pull, you can pull a, a brush stroke, you know, a long brush stroke across the canvas, but it's only going to go so long before you have to load paint up again. And that affects the integrity of that brush stroke and the, and the you know, the spontaneity of it. So it's right. difficult to, to do a very large painting. Some people's styles like Logan's style is very graphic and it, it adapts well to doing a large mural. And he's done some big, you know, garage door size paintings. My my style will not adapt to that because I'm relying on small marks, things I can control, um, even with like a number 12 hog bristle brush. You know, you can only get so much paint on that thing and, and only pull a, a stroke so far in control. Yeah. I cannot duplicate that on a super large canvas. So I don't I don't paint really large. I keep it, yeah. you know, nothing, nothing bigger than like a 40 by 50. Yeah. You would need like a like a mop or something like that. To, yeah. Right. And big know, buckets like, you know, of paint. You know, that's probably yeah. something. Do you know, did you know uh, an artist named Ken Oster? Oh yeah, man. He, oh. I, I remember seeing his, his demo. I don't know where I found it, like in the library or something at the Academy of Art. And he just like, he had, he was just scooping up paint and doing this thing. And I was like, what is going on? And then he painted this beautiful palm tree out of nowhere. And it was like, I stunning, visited him. You know? I was in Laguna Beach, um, where near where I, I grew up, and uh, I just dropped in and visited him out of nowhere. I mean, he had a little um, small gallery on the front side of his uh, his studio, so oh, you cool. could walk into that. Well, I walked in. I had like two hundred bucks in my pocket, and I asked him if he had any, um, you know, any little studies or something he would sell. And so he, he sold me a little painting. We got to talking, and that was at the time when he was doing. Uh, really large canvases and he said that the only way he could get enough paint up there he couldn't do it with brushes the brushes were too small and, and a, a really you know large wide you know house painting brush was too cumbersome it wouldn't work for him so right he advised putting on these gloves and getting gallon paints or cans of paint and he would scoop up paint in this gallon bucket push it onto the canvas and start smearing it around it to fill in a big shape and then you come back and and refine it with big brushes. But that's he said he couldn't get the paint on fast enough or before it started tacking up. Even oil paint with like medium mixed in, um, this was just the way that he found that worked for him was just doing it with his hands, because oh that mark, and that kept it, you know, it, it it kept the integrity of his kind of abstract style by yeah. doing it with his hands and just smearing stuff around. Um, but that's, that's how he kind of overcame that moving up to the next, you know, bigger size canvas. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. I, 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 I gotta go to watch. look at, yeah, that, that must be insane. You know, I, I mean, I look at, 
people like Frank Brangwin. Uh, do you know his work? Um, oh, yeah, I'm a huge Brangwin fan. Oh man, and like, and I remember um, in when I lived in San Francisco. Um, you can't I be a to go Dean to... Cornwell fan. You can't be a Dean Cornwell fan without being a Frank Brangwin fan. Yep. Amen to that. I mean, it's it's like he he if if for anyone uh who's in the San Francisco area or is going to San Francisco anytime soon, go to the Herbst Theater uh in in downtown and you will see Frank Brangwin murals. And I the only reason why I got was in there was for a concert that um my wife won tickets for on the radio to, to go to this Herbst you Theater. Did you know about him before that? No. No, I didn't know. Uh, you know, like I yeah, knew one Dean of those Cornwell. Things. Yeah, and and I was like, who did this? You know, like these paintings. You know, were just massive, and like this, the, just the, the brushstrokes on them, and like how everything connected, and how so well designed everything was. And well, and flowed, if you notice, you know, if you notice, and this is what Cornwell got from Brangwen, was working at that large scale. Um, not just Frank Brangwen, but other guys, even you know Edwin Austin Abbey and mm -hmm. uh, other guys that learn that that learn this um, technique of you know, when you get to that large scale again, because we don't grow with the painting, we're we're all humans are you know, the same size generally. To look at a big picture like that, for that picture to retain its integrity of the design, they found that putting a holding line or a key line around the major shapes held the, the integrity of the design together. And it, it kind of works in reverse too. If you go down, if you reduce something down to, you know, as an illustrator, we often work um, at a larger scale than what our, our work is going to be reproduced at, especially like a book cover or a magazine article right. illustration. So, um, you know, I have, you probably have one of those uh, demagnifying glasses. It looks like a, looks like a magnifying glass, but it makes things, shrinks them down. Yeah, so, yeah. You can either, you know, step back across the room to get a, a small idea of a smaller version of your art or use that demagnifying glass. But the same thing happens when you reduce something down, you start, things start to break up and any fine lines, especially like with a, a black and white illustration will fall away if they're so delicate. Once you get beyond that threshold of reproduction where it's, it's too small to reproduce. Um, so there's a consideration to be made for things that are really small or images that you blow up really large. And, you know, my my dad was, um, he was a hobby oil painter. When I was a little kid, I, that's where I first smelled turpentine and linseed oil was going out in the garage on the weekends. He'd, uh, wow. he'd loop around with paint. He never did anything with it, but he worked in sales for a big um, outdoor advertising company, a billboard company. And that's where he got the paint was from the guys in the art department. This is back in the day when they used to hand paint these giant billboards. Yeah, yeah. But it was a real design consideration for the guys that designed those boards to make something read. First of all, read quickly within, you have like two to three seconds going down the freeway to, to read a billboard and, and get the message. But um, even if you have more time to study it, they had, they still, there was still a lot of consideration had to go into the fact that something that's originally painted, you know, uh, maybe five feet by eight feet is now going to be going up to, you know, 40 feet by 60 feet. And it's going to have a different impact at that scale. Yeah. So they had to make adjustments to, to get the most out of those compositions uh, to make them read quickly, read well, and make sense because um, it was just a different scale. And you don't see this, those, those same things at a smaller size, the way you do when they're larger, or right. You know, so it's yeah, just. I, I remember seeing like um, you know, on Heritage Auction, you know, house they always have like the illustration original art sales, and seeing like um, you know, like uh, Hat and Sun Blooms, uh, oh, yeah. billboard so, illustration stuff. Like, it's it's so interesting to see his this the paintings that they blew up, like they look weird at that size like at least on my monitor and 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 it was the first time i i realized like oh my god this is designed to be a billboard not designed to be a like a painting to be viewed at that right the size yeah. that it's at so it's like this like weird like like why this shape you know sort of thing but when you would see it uh 
I, you know, like huge when you're driving by that, that would, it would work like immediately, uh, which yeah. is, uh, so you know, that's so like cool that. to see. Another set of, of dynamics that, that have to be figured out by you know, yeah. people with the whole design sense. I'm sure Sunbloom probably, you know, had a lot of art direction. I mean, the most art direction happens with advertising jobs. You know, you can do small, small budget spot illustrations for, you know, small circulation magazines. They'll pretty much just say, you know, here's the money. Just give me something in this general <laughs> subject matter. But a big advertising campaign, they're going to hold your hand through the whole thing. So oh, yeah. Yeah. imagine there was a designer working with Sunbloom to figure out, you know, the size of the person's head over here on the, on the right compared to the, the, the object they're selling, you know, it's going to be on right. the left and, you know, the, the scale of all that stuff had to be, you know, really thought out ahead of time, I think. Yeah. And, or, and even like people like painters, like, um, Joaquin Soroya, so like, like painting that large, like some of his massive, massive paintings, like, uh, like in the Hispanic society, um, right. th those murals, you know, that it was like, a, just a challenge of actually being able to do that. Um, at that I think scale probably i have a, so i have a good friend uh, named tim bell who's a, a a plain air painter a marine painter for the most part on the east coast and i f first saw him i went i was in a plain air show back east and he was there that's where i met him and he would wear a, a literally wear a path in the ground from his easel back about 40 feet just going back and forth back and forth continually um, evaluating his his composition and his values from a distance. And because he paints very um, real loose, great, great style, but, mm -hmm. but uh, a real designer. And to understand how his design, if it was working or not, he had to view it from a distance. Yeah. And I see those paintings that Soroya did, most all of which were, you know, done from life. I'm sure that he did the same thing. He probably had to step way back because that's when you get a sense. It's kind of like um, when you paint a landscape out, out in, in the field, you squint, you have to squint your eyes a lot. And squinting your eyes, um, for anybody who doesn't know, it kind of uh, it diffuses your vision and it sort of eliminates all the extraneous details that are vying for your attention when you're you know, focusing on a distant tree or a distant hill. And it also kind of... Um, uh, simplifies all the values that you're looking at. Um, some guys will, you know, they'll, they'll turn upside down and look at the horizon to to remind themselves that that you know, depending on where the sun is, the land, the landscape, the flat part of the of the plane of the landscape might be brighter than the sky is. You know, like uh, in the in the middle of the day, it would be. Later in the day, your whatever's vertical in the distance is going to be catching more light than the ground is. But the, sometimes those differences are really subtle and you can't see them unless you squint your eyes or, you know, somehow get a different perspective on what you're painting. And so, you know, either standing way back from your painting and evaluating it that way um, or, you know, squinting or there's there's different things you can do. But you have to always get a different perspective using a mirror in the studio. I have a I have a bunch of H frame studio or uh, easels. Easels, yeah. I've been collecting over the years so one of them is it just holds a big mirror on it and it's behind me so when i'm painting um i learned this from comic books years ago there was a guy i can't think of his name right now in fact i shouldn't say his name He's, he might still be working but he was clearly a right-handed painter and he did a lot of comic book covers and all of his compositions they would they would like bend to the right because he was all his strokes oh, okay. are going, was, you know, yeah. lower left to upper right. <laughs> and I I thought, you know, does this guy realize what he's doing? And I never I never wanted to be that guy. So being a right-handed painter, when I started using a mirror, I started catching some some stuff that my brain wasn't seeing when I was looking at the painting um, until I looked in the mirror and got an opposite view. And then I could see a lot of my lines were leaning one way or the other well leaning to the right because i was right-handed same thing happens with a left-handed you know you just naturally you know your arm swings like this right right oh so using a mirror to see to check over my shoulder every once in a while i can keep those things in check and make sure and it helps too just for keeping 
you know, when designing, laying out a painting to keep things balanced, sometimes I might have too many things, maybe all my verticals that are breaking the horizontal uh, line are over on one side too much. And, and when I get an opposite view in the mirror, I can see, well, I could balance this better if I brought one over to this side. So it's real good to have a, you know, some guys will take their paintings and turn them upside down just to get a different perspective. And sometimes yeah. that will flaws in your design. So it's always good to to find a way to, to check yourself um, and not just trust what your eyes are seeing by looking just right read at your painting all the time. Well, I mean, uh, on, on that, on that note, I mean, um, in terms of process, uh, for you, I mean, uh, how are you, uh, like I have like from your, for your blog, which by the way, all, all of the descriptions from Eric's website and, um, and the blog will be in the description of the video. So, uh, please look out, uh, for that. Uh, but, um, I had found that, you know, uh, this process uh, piece for a commission. I know it wasn't like a gallery painting, but it was a commission. Um, yeah. But for your, your, your pieces are so well put together because um, they're so thought out okay. in terms of like, it's not, it's not like a, um, uh, I'll, I'll have to gush, you know, and uh, a little bit, but it's like, they're so well designed and, and thought out. Every, everything has a place in your, in your pieces. So are you um like I, when they I see work they do. All, when they work they do right yeah I know well you know I'm still waiting for mine to to work Eric you know so but uh they so, so are you are, are you following this um exact like I see like a thumbnail here um a and then a more refined drawing and and other exploratory things yeah. um maybe uh talk about that that sort of journey that you that you go through in making, you know, like a, I don't know, like a piece, like, a, like something like this. Um, so um, coming up with initial design that could be sparked by anything, by, you know, seeing a real live cowboy on horseback doing something or a photo or seeing some great dead guy art that I flipped through, you know, I have a large library I kind of, I supplement the lack of education I have with a very large library of great art books. So I'll flip through books in the morning, usually to get warmed up. And uh, I might see something in there that triggers my mind. And so I'll come up with an idea, a concept. And like just about every other artist, I'll get my sketchbook out and just start doodling little thumbnail sketches just out of my imagination. And then um, if I, you know, if that evolves into something I think might work, I'll do a tighter sketch up big and, or not. Well, when I say big, maybe like six by eight or eight by 10. And then um, if that's worthy of going further, then I'll get better reference. I'll either shoot models or, you know, once in a, in a blue moon, I'll have a live person come and sit for something if it's a stationary kind of scene, but for people moving on horses, you can't do that. So I have to rely on, on photos and I'll go and do photo shoots. Like I'm, I'm actually going to Taos, New Mexico in a couple of weeks to gather some fresh reference, but um, I'll get, you know, I'll gather photographic reference and do a drawing from that and then do um, a small uh, color study or two, usually in acrylic because, you know, as we talked before, acrylics dry really quick. And, um, and then uh from there go to the final canvas. So it's a step-by-step -step process, but, and you eliminate the thing that the weird thing is, is when you go through these different, um, especially if I do more than one color study, the, uh, the, the, the color temperature of the palette often changes with each successive study I do because I'll improve or I'll, I'll eliminate things I don't like out of the last version. So the next version, the third or fourth version will improve. And sometimes the composition will change along the way as well. And um, so, yeah, it's it's always helpful. And you you work out all the, I mean, you know how this works, Ray. You, you work yeah. out all the kinks you know, without taking any chances by doing uh, the studies. So, you know, that takes up time, of course, to do the studies. And I've and I've had to fight that that monster inside that just wants to skip all that and go right to the to the finished painting right. and have fun doing that. 
But every time I've tried that, I end up inevitably running into the same problems and then I've got to correct them on the finished painting and that's no fun. Right. So right. it's better to waste. And that, guy, and, and, and that guy that was, that monster was yelling at you is nowhere to be found. You know, they've, they've, yeah, yeah. He never you know. takes any credit for causing the problem. Right. So um, yeah, it's, it's always, it's always worth the time to do the studies. Um, you know, the, the, I used to complain and probably everybody else did back in the day when I was doing illustration, you have, um, you know, a short uh, deadline. Maybe you've got, you know, three days to do an illustration. And you're looking at Norman Rockwell, who had like three months lead time on a, on a Saturday evening post cover. So yeah. he could do all those studies and go and, and go out and travel the country and get, you know, reference from the, the locale of the story he's illustrating and do all because And the budget covered all of that too. Well, budgets right. don't cover those things and, they, and you don't have the time. So Sometimes you have to dive right into a painting without a lot of prep work. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. But I think that like the, uh, you know, the advantage of studies, especially like with, with painting where like the mark making is, is really important and uh, just things that are, you know, considered texture and like, um, uh, uh, I think all of that, the final all that comes through and that kind of culmination of all that like experience you 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 build up from doing the studies uh and I, at least i have at least for me i have so much more fun with the final and that i just kind of let the painting be the painting and yeah, they have this the pressure, wonderful freshness to it the pressure's off by then because you've you know hopefully you've worked out all the problems the only downside is i've i've had to abandon some portions of paintings in the study period version because I just couldn't replicate it in the finished painting. It was like mm -hmm. a, a happy accident that happened and yeah. I couldn't replicate that in the final canvas because it, it's just what it was. It was an accident and yeah. you, know, you, can't, you can't have that control over that thing. So, you know, and that's when the study, maybe a few extra strokes on it, you can turn that into a viable gallery piece too, you know, a smaller mm -hmm. version. Right. But yeah. That's the it, problem that frustrates me sometimes. Ah, uh, it's 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 like a uh, it's it's such a fush. I I share your frustration. I I uh, do you know John Rush by any chance? Uh, I don't know him personally, but I know his work. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so I studied with him um, at the academy, and he he's the one that really taught me the value of color studies um, and designing, like how you could use that as a vehicle for designing. John used to always tell me like. You know, like you, you were just saying, you know, like uh, the the last place you're going to take, a, a, like if, if, you know, if you just skip to the final, you're going to have all these problems and right. you're going to need to take a risk on in changing them. And the last place you want to take a risk on it, you as an artist is going to be on that final. You're just going to not want to mess anything up. So you're, you know, uh, it's game over, you know, at that point for uh, the process. And so, but John and I would talk about this like at nauseum in terms of, just when, when you see certain painters where they just have this moment where it's like four or five brush strokes, you know, um, like Edgar Payne, you know, like in, oh, yeah. and I could, you could see from his studies, like he was capturing kind of the spirit of that, but to replicate that is such a, yeah, yeah. Edgar Payne, so hard, you know, big, bold brush strokes. And, you know, I have some, I've, I have a whole history of crappy paintings I've done over the years. And a lot of them were, uh, and this is this is partly um, something I really can't overcome because I don't have, it's not an attention span thing, but I'm not one of these guys the, that can lock myself in a room and just paint for 19 hours to, to you know, do a finished painting. Um, like uh, uh, there was a, a Japanese artist who died a while back, big illustrator. Uh, it was a Kazuki Kusano? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's his son. yeah. Yeah. So I read a, an interview with him once and he said that he would basically do that, just lock himself away in the studio and work like nine hours straight on an illustration. I can't work on a painting for more than two hours before I, uh, especially if it's working, um, I kind of want to savor the, that time when it's, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like I tell everybody, all my paintings start out awesome. They all start out <laughs> awesome. Um, and so two hours into it, if it's working and feeling good, 
I have to go check my email or I have to go do something else. I don't have the, and, and again, I don't think it's an attention span thing. I think it's, it's maybe it's a nervous thing or something, but I can't just push through and just paint, 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 paint until it's done. Yeah. I have to, I have to step back and take some time off. And um, so now I'm forgetting where we were going with that. Well, you, you were talking about just kind of being able to capture the, Oh, like bro, uh, saying, so yeah. Edgar Payne. Yeah, right. So Edgar yeah. Payne, when I look at his work, you can't go back to a painting that's painted like he paints with, you know, thick hog bristle brushes that have all those little micro shadows from the brush strokes yeah. after it's dry and then put a brush stroke going in a different direction over on top of it. It would just look like a blatant mistake. And that's what a bunch of my paintings look like because by the time I came back sometime on some of those paintings, or maybe it was the next day and I wanted to change something. I'm painting over dried brush strokes with fresh ones that aren't matching up with the old brush stroke. And it just looks like a blatant error. And I hate that, you know? So it's either if I'm going to try and paint like, like a Sunbloom or, or like an Edgar Payne, um, it's all or nothing. And it's all in one session or forget it. Yeah. You know, it's like Soroya, you know, he painted wet into wet, those big things in one session, a lot of them. And that's why they work. And that's why they have that, that lively, you know, they retain the spontaneity because it was all in one juicy session and it, you know, it still has that freshness to it. But so my style is, you know, wet over dry and then dry over the wet and, you know, back and forth until I come up with, you know, something I'm comfortable with. So yeah. I'm not, not a wet into wet painter by any means. Yeah. Unless it's, it's, unless it's, it's a plain air study. That's, that's about right. It. Yeah. I, I think it's, it, uh, it's an awesome looking. I, I love the texture though, and the layered, the layered quality of it. That that you can kind of like. I love when the wet, and I I find out like I, I love the idea of like you know that what you get by going dry, like a a, a fresh coat of paint over something that's right. you know wet over dry, and you get these sort of really wonderful textural effects. That kind of brings me back to like my love for illustration work, especially like really layered mixed media stuff. Yeah. Um, like, you know, uh, just like, like Drew Struzan's like uh, work or just like Mark English or, you know, just the list goes on like Thomas Black. Like, yeah, there's effects you cannot get wet into wet. You've got yeah. to let the surface tack up. I call it for me, I call it the Oreo effect where <laughs> I start out, I start out thin, like most traditional oil painters, because, you know, you want to keep things under control and be able to wipe a passage off if it's not working and, you know, lay down a new thin layer. Um, and then uh, and then once I get things dialed into the, the, the value and the temperature that I want, then I might load up some thicker hog bristle brushes and come in with those thick strokes and, you know, really pile on some paint. And then for an extra effect, after that tacks up, I like to come back with a thin synthetic brush, but do dry brush marks. So you've got the, you have a physical texture with the, the hog bristle brush strokes. And then you have um, a visual texture with the, the uh, dry brush, which kind of skips over the surface. It's still flat. It's not a physical texture, but it has an optical texture or illusion of texture. And right. combining those two, you know, just adds another layer of interest to a painting. Right, right. Almost like a, a like an oil pastel, like a scumble over the the whole thing right. that that kind yeah. of like op, op, optically mixes and, and things like that. So, I mean, how, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, how, how long are some of these um, taking for you, you know, um, just because, I mean, they're, they're not, for me, they're not small paintings. I mean, they're, I mean, these are, 30 by 30, you know, uh, 36 by 46. Um, it, it's hard to say really, because most of these are either from a solo show or, or a museum show where I had three to five paintings. So I'm usually working on at least two paintings at a time. Hmm. Um, okay. Ideally it's two paintings at a time with maybe a third painting on deck that as one finishes, I'll bring that one. Um, and so I don't, you know, it's not like back when I was doing illustration, I kept a, I had a timesheet, you know, I kept a log of how long it took me, you know, working on a job. 
and I don't do that with painting, but you know, roughly these paintings are all in the, if it's just the painting part we're talking about, it might be a two week period. If you factor in the model shoot, the sketches, the, the color studies, all that, then it's, you know, exponentially longer. Right. Um, you know, and some are, are quicker and, and some are, some take longer, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's generally like a week to two weeks of intense painting after I get the design figure out transferred to canvas and I'm ready to start a little painting. Right. Right. I mean, that's, that's still, you know, fast, but the bigger, but, you know, the bigger yeah. ones, the smaller ones can be a couple days. Like, um, and I have, I also have a, a, a comfort rule for myself when it comes to surface, uh, anything that's maybe 12 by 16 and smaller is going to be just straight gesso on a panel. I don't want, I don't want the, the uh, texture of canvas or linen. Um, and this is for finished paintings. When I go out in the field and paint in plain air, like I'm taking my paints with me to Taos in a couple of weeks, I have a whole stack of uh, a little eight by 10 linen panels that I made. I don't mind the texture there because I'm just going to be painting fast and loose and just big shapes, you know, doing landscape mm -hmm. stuff. But to do to do a figure or a face, something with that that has some degree of detail in it, on a small scale, I want a fairly smooth surface. So I'm in control because once you get too small with some details and you've got a bumpy, lumpy, you know, linen surface, it can create problems. And right. then when I go to medium size. And larger, I want either linen glued to a panel or cotton canvas stretched on stretcher bars. I've had problems with um, stretching linen, uh, and I know a lot of people do, and they and they figure out a way to overcome it. But I had a painting in a show at the Coors uh, Western show a few years ago that was stretched linen, and it was stretched tight, and everything was good. But it didn't sell in the show, and it came back to me. When it came back, the corners were all sagging because the linen. Oh man, that's had happened lapped. to me. You know, it had yeah. gone through. Yeah, it'd gone through some humidity or, or you know some different um, environmental temperatures, and and it, so it looked horrible. And I'm sure it probably looked like that hanging in the show, and that's why nobody was interested in it. So I restretched it and I sent it to a gallery, and they sold it right away. So it wasn't a bad painting. It was just the presentation was bad because that linen had sagged, and so I've been you know, kind of paranoid to stretch linen ever since. So I'll, stretch, <laughs> I'll stretch, I'll use a, um, like Frederick's brand universal is the, the model or the, the style of, of canvas, cotton canvas that I like. It's, it's not as, um, uniform a weave. Like you can get some cheap canvas. that looks like you're painting on a screen door, you know, that's yeah. just, that's just so ugly. So, um, universal is one that I found that's fairly close to a linen, you know, sort of an uneven, uneven weave kind of texture to it. So I use those, um, but I don't, I don't want to take chances stretching a giant, you know, 40 by 50 giant yeah. for me, um, linen canvas and then have it sag on me when, you know, it's going to an important show. So right, right. those are the three right. surfaces I like though, linen, cotton, and then just straight gesso. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, they, they do make a, a, a difference and it's, it's, uh, I, you know it's cool that like it's like um it's also a mental thing for me like I, I i have things in the studio that like i only do for certain pieces you know um where like uh whether it be textured or where, whether it be like just the way i put a gesso down like if i know it's going to be a big piece i'm going to do certain cert something different from if i know if it's going to be a small piece you know um and uh and um, I know half of the stuff I do, it doesn't really ever, no one's ever going to notice it, but I notice it. Like, you know, I, the, the experience of painting it is such a, such a difference, you know, there's yeah, a way, difference, you know, it's your way of working. That's why I don't, you know, I stopped making excuses for myself years ago when people would find out I didn't go to school. It was embarrassing. You know, it's like, I wish I had gone to school, but now, you know, I just, I just paint the way I paint, you know, and, and I, and I, I'll concede this, that there's probably a, a more efficient way to arrive at, at a, you know, a finished painting than the way I do it, but I only know one way to do it. 
and that's the way I do it. So, um, you know, again, if you can, if you can afford to, and if you can find a good art school, go and have somebody else show you, you know, the correct way to do something, because I don't know if I'm doing it correct or not. I just, I, I, I eventually get when it, when it's successful, I eventually got there probably taking the wrong route because I'm doing it out of ignorance rather than knowing the correct way that's been handed down, you know, through the generations from the master painters. And I just kind of wing it, you know, but sometimes yeah. it works. Well, I, I could tell you that um, looking at your, your pieces, you might not have gone to art school, but you're an extremely educated painter. Uh, and there's a, uh, there's definitely, you know, one, one doesn't, uh, it doesn't come with the the other, you know, like just because you go to art school doesn't turn you into an, an educated painter. And you well, it's are, experience. You, it's all, yeah, you know, it's all experience. And, and you, you learn things, the greatest, the greatest, uh, I think, um, help to, uh, to any artist is, um, is befriending other artists, you know, getting into a, 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 a circle of, of your peers and bouncing ideas back and forth and sharing what you know with each other. I learned a ton of things about painting and oils by doing uh, plein air competitions and just meeting other artists. And, you know, you click, you hang out and you go paint together and you, you're looking at their palette and you ask them, you know, Oh, why do you use this? And, and what, Oh, what kind of medium is that? And, you know, and you, you just kind of learn on the, on the fly on these things. And there's a lot of, you know, you don't learn everything either in, in art school. I, I have right. a very good friend of mine, um, who graduated art center and he didn't know half the stuff I knew about the business side of making a living, you know, the, the, the school right. of Knox side of being a professional artist, because they don't, at least they weren't teaching it, you know, from all the people I knew that went to college back then. Um, I had to learn how to, how to deal with clients and how to bill and, and, you know, all of that stuff. So you know, there's, there's really no, there's no roadmap, you know, there's, there's a few road signs, but there's just no roadmap to being a professional painter. You you learn as you go. And, you know, as long as you're exposing yourself to other like-minded individuals and gleaning what you can from them, um, you can have a rich, uh, knowledgeable, you know, understanding of things. It's just, it's kind of, um, you know, you, you you gather these things as you go. You learn about new tools and new products come on the market and you have to try these different things to, to find what you like. And then, you know, keep pushing, pushing forward with those things, hopefully get better. Right. And if your partner comes in with a Croyer print and asks you to, to paint it, uh, take the opportunity, you know, you, have to do it. you never know what it's, what it's going to, how it's going to affect never... And that's, a, that's another important thing too, Ray, is that, um, I fooled myself many times over the years, looking at a piece of art and thinking, "Okay, I know how I know how they did that." And then I go and I try to replicate or emulate the style that I'm enamored with by this dead guy's work, and I try to do it in my limited knowledge. And I realize once I get in there and start trying to do it, that I really don't know how they did it. You know, I thought I did by looking at it. Well, it can't be that difficult. I see some dry brush here and, and I see what he did with the edge work here. You know, I, I can do that. But when I started to do it, I couldn't replicate their technique because it was solely owned by them. You know, I mean, the the, the greatest artists have such a, a singular thumbprint, you know, voice that's all their own. And you can't, you know, you can't, no matter how hard you try to, to uh, make a copy of it you're just you're going to fail because it's it's theirs it's not yours you know the way i paint is mine and i can own that but um yeah it's it's there's a lot more to it than just visually what you see to creating art yeah absolutely well that that's a i think that's a perfect perfect point to to end the uh this awesome talk um i'd, I'd be remiss to um if i didn't uh, mention that you currently have a solo show up at uh, Maxwell Alexander Gallery. Um, you just came back from the opening, which is three three paintings so, left. Yeah, wow, that's so awesome! And uh, I mean, there's all these like wonderful videos uh, on it. Beautiful. I mean, this 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 oh, show is stunning, Eric. Shout Man, out I, to I, Maxwell I like, I love Alexander. 
that gallery is it's the top gallery as far as i'm concerned the way you know just the staple of artists they have or a bunch of them are my heroes but the way they treat their artists and the the time and money they put into promoting their artists is is unmatched as far as i know it's you know he came up twice you know it's a thousand miles from there to my studio came up in the in the spring and again in the summer early summer and did video interviews with me um you know they bought uh advertising in in several magazines they did a full color catalog all this on their dime and uh you know i i i'm sure my career wouldn't be where it is at this point if i wasn't with these guys cuz they're just they're so good at at promoting and really uh forwarding a, a, an artist's career awesome yeah it's a i i mean i love love this gallery and all all the artists uh uh in it you know so uh present company in, included so um but uh yeah so congrats on the on the show and i hope those i'm sure those three won't won't be around for long um they they were any of them painted on uh linen stretch linen uh yeah scroll down and i'll I'll okay. just no, it was just a it was just a joke. That's probably why they didn't sell, you know, if, if they were because oh, no, no, no. No, 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 there are some linen ones, but like that one, this one here is linen, but it's it's glued to a panel. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. I was just, just like yeah, just just checking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Eric, thanks so much um for uh, hey, it was uh fun. for yeah. doing this, man. Yeah, this was great and and long overdue. Um thanks for reaching and, out. Uh, no, my my pleasure, and um, uh, thanks for being so so gracious with your time and um, just with Absolutely. your process and everything like that. Uh, did if you I have did anything podcasts, else that you, you? Only I was say if I was going to say if I did did podcast, I you'd definitely be on my list too. <laughs> thanks, so, man. Um, yeah, nothing else I could say. I mean, you had great questions. Of course, we could just go on and on talking shop about painting and, and great painters of the past and so forth, but. Uh, yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a real honor to be on your podcast. So thanks again. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Eric. All right. You take care, Ray.